Hello everyone, my name is Ben, and I've lost my voice. I know, it's very careless of me, I'm usually a better person than this. But as the old saying goes, the show must go on, so without further ado, let's get going. Oh, and I'm very happy to take questions at any time during the talk. Feel free to make this as interactive as you like. But be aware that the answer you receive was written this morning at 1am. If it sounds relevant to your question, I assure you, it's entirely coincidental. Okay, JWT, what is it good for? Absolutely everything. Almost. In this session, I want to take you back to a time when online life was scary, if only we knew it at the time. Let's go on a journey. Turn right in 300 meters. No, not that kind of journey. Sorry about that. Who remembers seeing one of these screens? This is Friend Finder, and a variety of implementations could be found on any number of social media sites in the early 2000s in order to quickly and painlessly invite your friends to the platform. It was an ingenious idea, because there's no point in having a social network with just a handful of users. I see a number of you looking amused, and you probably know where I'm going next. At least one of you is crying now, and I don't think it's happy tears. If we look at this form, you'll notice that Facebook is asking for their email address, and the password they log into their email service with. See, I told you life was scary back then. But wait, there's more. Let's dive into one possible implementation to see how much scarier this actually was. And please note that I'm not picking on Facebook particularly. Most social networks did this, and it was a very bad idea. So let's start with the user on the left, and the social network web server on the right. To kick the process off, the user sends their email address and email password to the server. Next, the server will make a direct connection to the email provider, but not to an API. It will pretend to be a human user of a web browser, and dynamically screen scrape the data. That's right, the social network was now logged in as the user and had full access to everything. Contacts, emails, the lot. After gathering all the contact details, the social network would store these in their own database, in order to then send out emails to each contact inviting them to join the network. But wait, how would they send these emails? I hear you ask. Through the user's email provider of course. Why would you add complexity of sending emails from your system, which would appear to come from your product, when you can send an email by screen scraping your way into the compose view in the user's email provider, and send the email directly from that user? Psychologically, people would be more likely to join a platform that their friends personally invited them to than if they got a generic email from the platform itself. And then to top it all off. In all likelihood, the social network would also store each contact in their own database as a ghost user from the outset. This allows them to start building a vague profile of each person immediately, even if they don't sign up until years later. What could go wrong? And of course, this is all very questionable, whether it's okay to store information about someone who hasn't yet signed up for your services. But let's remind ourselves of the real WTF. The user has to share their email credentials for this to work. So I'm able to turn my microphone on every now and then, and as you can tell, my voice really is buggered. And I promise you, I, I wish this was because I had a good time a few days ago. Unfortunately, that's not the reason. Um, I'd like to take a brief pause to thank Phil for lending me his laptop, which is currently outputting this audio. Um, and as you may notice, his phone is also connected to his laptop. So if we get any calls, I will try and answer them. And if you can all speak up when that happens, we will, I don't know, maybe we can rickroll somebody that he knows. <laughs> all right. OAuth 2.0 to the rescue. This authorization protocol was designed to remove the need to share credentials and also added in constraints or scopes of operations that could be performed once a system had been authorized. Let's see how that works. Rather than sending credentials to the social network, the user starts the friend finder process with a simple request. The server responds with a redirect to the email provider, which the user can then log into. The email provider will then generate a token for the user, which is limited to the scope of, for example, reading the user's contact list, and the user can then pass that token to the social network. 
Finally, the social network server can request a contact list from the email provider's API, using the token to verify that access has been granted, and the email provider can return the contact list. As for sending emails, that was always something the social network should have sorted themselves, and we can't stop them from creating those dodgy ghost accounts either. Click is lagging a little bit. <laughs> so, some examples of what an OAuth 2.0 authorization might allow. LinkedIn can read emails on Gmail. TweetDeck can post tweets on Twitter. Eventbrite can create events on Facebook. But how can we get identity information from another provider? I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. This led to most large sites implementing their own way of doing this. Allowing someone to log into a website with Google, for example, would be hugely valuable to Google, while making it easier for users who didn't have to go through the process of creating a new account. So as you can see, we're at a process now, or at a point now, where there's obviously a desire for identity to be something that we can pass between entities in a secure way without having to share credentials with our systems as well. Um, and we're very early on in the process here where sister, uh, well, large organizations like Google and Facebook and MySpace, anybody still have a MySpace account? Mm -hmm. Just me, okay. Um, they, they wanted to be able to provide uh, facilities for their users to be able to log into third party systems. And I, or rather Daniel, if you have a Mac and you say, hey, that's Daniel, everybody, Daniel, Daniel, everybody. Um, Daniel was talking about that seems really weird. I was talking about how uh, Google benefits from this, and one of the ways that these organizations would benefit from it is that they would become seen as a, a, a safe space to be, to have an identity. Um, people would sign up for a Google account because they want to log into another system. Uh, after having done it once, they could log into multiple places afterwards. Uh, the benefit to the user is that they don't have to remember, I mean, we shouldn't be remembering passwords anyway. Everybody uses a password manager, right? Three of you. I'm worried for I'm worried for humanity. Um, yeah, so we came up with this user info um, process, but it was so new. As with anything, when whenever four or five large organisations want to do something, you look at it nowadays with um, APIs within browsers. The kind of things that um, people are playing with, like the bleeding edge APIs that are just coming in, they're all implemented differently. They're totally incompatible with each other, and they have to then work together to build something that's more compatible. So I added that in because I think I skipped it a little bit uh, in, in the text part. In much the same way as OAuth 2.0 could be used to get contact details, a token could allow the retrieval of information about the user. As with all new ideas, each provider implemented it differently, returning different response formats. What can go wrong? OpenID Connect was ratified to standardize the way to retrieve the data and the format that should be expected. And it was really simple. We like simple. It's basically a simple identity layer that sits on top of OAuth 2.0. We'll actually verify the identity. Obtain basic profile information from the provider. Is REST based. So we know how to make the request in every situation. And returns JSON. A flexible, extensible, but predictable data structure. I realized how good it was to be able to drink while you're giving a talk. <laughs> it's coffee, by the way. It'll be beer later. And that brings us to JWTs, or JSON Web Tokens. This is what they look like. Any questions? <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. It's been great. <laughs> OK, let's dig in. If we look closely, we'll see three parts separated by full stops. These are the header, the payload, and the signature. The first two are base64 URL encoded JSON, which we can easily decode. A typical identity token might have a header and payload like this. Note that they aren't encrypted, just encoded, so you shouldn't be storing sensitive data in them. In the payload, we'll see certain keys like SUB, which stands for subject, and AIT which is the issued at timestamp for the token. It's best not to use these for another purpose, but being JSON you can add any arbitrary data in that you want. 
you've seen some situations, given your reaction, that should, probably should not see the light of day. Has yes. anybody ever played with JSON Web Tokens before? Is this brand new to anybody? Brand new to a couple of you? Yeah, so there's always been this debate about how secure are they. Um, like I mentioned, they're not encrypted. You can get encrypted JSON Web Tokens. Um, but yeah, by and large, you should just treat them as information that gets sent around but is totally readable by anybody. Uh, if you're really clever, you could probably decode that in your head. I certainly can't. Probably most of us can't. Um, but yeah, I mean, people can look at this and go, oh, that's cool, I can send that and nobody can read it. But it's actually just basically break, break downable, I think that's a word, uh, into readable text. I think I'll just call it a confirmation that break downable is in the dictionary. Thanks. <clears throat> and to create the signature, in this example based on an asynchronous HMAC256 algorithm, we take the base64 URL encoded header and payload and use a pre-shared key. Any system can regenerate the signature in the future, to compare with the signature in the token, in order to verify the header and payload have not been altered after the token was issued. And best of all, the receiving party can verify the token and rely on the payload without having to communicate with the issuer. So just as an aside, if you want to see the script of this and the words I had to write for it to be able to pronounce the words properly, and it still gets it wrong, come chat to me afterwards. I'll have to show you. There's another JWT, the access token, that contains different information in the payload. Here you can see the issuer, the subject, the audience that is permitted to consume the token, and at the bottom, the scope. In this example, the bearer of this access token could send a message to the example API to post a new article, but presumably not delete anything. Now that you have a better understanding of what JWTs are, how they can relate to authorization and identity, and what protections they contain that make them trustable, let's have a look at a couple of scenarios in which this can be useful. This one looks like a plate of spaghetti, but if you look at the two orange lines, they are the only communications that include user credentials. When logging in from the web browser or a mobile app, the user authenticates themselves to the identity provider, which returns tokens that can be used for all future requests. The mobile device can make authorized requests to the API, the web server can retrieve resources from the web server, the database can use the identity token to filter results or determine the right to update entries, and even the Active Directory server on the right can join the party by providing single sign-on to all users without the applications needing to communicate with it at all. You ever tried to talk to Active Directory? Either you are not admitting to it because you have pains that you don't want to discuss, <laughs> or you have not experienced the pain, so please don't go there. But perhaps more interestingly, we can augment token payloads to allow business logic to act more intelligently, or even to eliminate certain infrastructure altogether. Here we see a hypothetical React app that renders a web store based on product data in Stripe, which it retrieved using Metlify functions but we need some way of connecting Stripe customers to Auth0 users. Usually, we'd implement a custom database for this. In this scenario, we're going to store this information in Auth0 and Stripe. When a user logs in, Auth0 will make sure a Stripe customer exists for them, and if not, we'll create one. Stripe will be given the Auth0 user ID, and will return the new Stripe customer ID which will be stored against the Auth0 user, giving us a bi-directional connection between two entities on separate systems. Next, we'll return the token to the React app, right after we add the Stripe customer ID to the payload. Now the React app can call Netlify functions that proxy through to Stripe's API, and knowing the Stripe customer ID, all orders are correctly hooked up and associated with the currently logged in user. Each situation you face will require a specific consideration of the pros and cons of each design choice, but this setup could potentially be ready for production for lower traffic websites, and scaling could be achieved through caching and the use of content delivery networks before a custom database needs to be considered. It's a great example of the ability we have nowadays to rapidly build and deploy near production ready applications in hours or days, instead of the weeks and months of yesteryear. All right, let me try and use my voice a little. I worked out that if I try and relax my vocal cords, I can actually project a little bit more. But the problem is that I get excited about what I'm talking about and my whole body tenses up, and then this happens and I can't talk properly. 
<clears throat> so normally when I give this talk, um, it's a lot more interactive. So this is actually like pretty much the end um, because when you pre-script a talk, you can't anticipate what kind of questions are going to be in the audience. I want to try and use my voice as much as is possible and answer any questions you do have. See, it's going again already. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to point out is that actually, I've, I'm just going to ignore the speaking dude. He's got a couple more things to say, but they're, they're not important <clears throat> enough that I can't say them myself. So the workshop that I mentioned is actually available on GitHub. If you want to play with it, it's self-guided. You can do it yourself. You might even find a video out there of me giving that um, bad workshop. And one thing I wanted to get out of that, it'll take probably about three, four hours, roughly. Um, don't have to do it in one go. It's broken down into steps. Um, but it'll take you through various things. It'll actually help you set up the React app, get Auth0 configured, get Stripe configured, and um, you basically end up with a, a functioning web app that you could, uh, like a, a web store, that you could potentially put into production. I'm not going to say it's 100% production ready. I haven't tested it. I'll leave it to you to decide whether or not that's something you want to do. Um, but it's a really good way of playing with uh, new ways and thinking outside of the box with development. And one of the things that I like about JSON Web Tokens is that they encapsulate this information that allows you to communicate more than just um, like an opaque token, the old <clears throat> tokens that we're used to that have no data inside them or no readable data. You can't do anything with them other than go to the issuer and say, what does this allow me to do? By using a JSON Web Token, you can expand through that flexibility of the payload. Um, but it, any information you want in there, bearing in mind, the more information you put in, the bigger the payload, the bigger the token, and that token goes in the header request of every uh, the header of every request. And you don't want to be in a situation where your requests are so big that you've got latency and, and scalability issues. So bear that in mind as well. Um, but JWTs do give you a lot of scope for playing in ways that would normally not be possible to do the, yeah, this one without a custom database um, would be extremely hard if it were not for the functionality that JWTs bring us. So they're really simple, really small, really almost overlookable technology, um, but the things that you can do with them are so varied and um, uh, interesting, I guess, in certain ways. So <clears throat> if you have the time, I would highly recommend that, wrong button, that you, at the very least, have a look at the repo and basically like the readme is the instructions for how to get through it and just get an idea of what kind of things you can do in that situation and maybe that'll then uh, give you a, a different perspective of how you can use them in, in your applications and in your systems at work or not at work as well. So I will take questions. I think that microphone there might be so people at home can hear you. Uh, hopefully they can hear me. And hopefully, if you have questions, I will have the uh, vocal stamina to give you a response. But aside from that, um, thank you for sticking around for what is a very short presentation, but hopefully the value has been shown, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the, the conference. Thanks. <laughs> I have had people coming up to me saying, I'm not going to talk to you because I don't want you to ruin your voice. My only talk is now given. Feel free to ruin my voice. <laughs> it's, it's good. Well, in which case, let's uh, get some of our time back and go back outside and mingle with the sponsors. Thank you. Thank you.